This year, I think nearly half the world have elections or something. Um, so I wanted to look a bit about voting, because voting systems is quite a big discussion. Now, I'm not going to pass value judgment on any of them. This is not that kind of channel. Um, but there are particular ways of voting that become really interesting. So let's imagine we have three voters and three candidates. And they're each going to put down their top three preferences. They're going to order all of them. Say voter one first likes candidate A, they put candidate B second and C third. Voter two favours candidate B. Second, they want candidate C and third, they like candidate A. And now for voter three, we'll say they want candidate C first. Second, they'll put candidate A and third, they'll put candidate B. So who should win this election? Suppose we choose A, because A is the top choice of voter one. But both voter 2 and voter 3 prefer C over A. So we could say, if we look at A and C, C beats A. What about B? Well, B is voter 2's preference, but both voter 1 and voter 3 prefer A to B. So A beats B. But in a similar way, B beats C because, OK, voter 1 and voter 2 both prefer B to C. So we've kind of got this loop. We can't really decide who wins. And this is going to be a familiar thing to everyone, because this is rock, paper, scissors, right? And this is known as the Condorcet paradox. So Condorcet was a French political philosopher and mathematician. He was around the age of enlightenment. He wasn't the first person to come up with this. In the 13th century, there was, I think, a Spanish mathematician called Ramon Lull. I'm sure someone's going to correct the pronunciation. Who came up with this similar paradox, um, but then a lot of his writing um, died with him, basically. So Condorcet popularised this. And it does beg the question, what can we do? Um, so there are two types of winners I'm going to introduce you to for elections. Now, I'm talking about elections because that's topical. Um, this can also be applied to sports, for example, in round-robin tournaments. If you are to, say, watch, I don't know, the Euros or the Six Nations, you will also have similar things. There are two types of winners. We've got the majority winner and a Condorcet winner. And they're very similar. Majority winner basically means that at least half of voters would support this candidate in a one-on-one -on -one competition against any individual. So in this case, at least two voters would support this candidate against any other. So at least two supports A over B, at least two supports A over C, A becomes a majority winner. Now, the Condorcet winner only needs to be unbeaten, so it allows for ties. Now, we know there's not always a Condorcet winner. We've seen here that there's not. Um, and this is a very hypothetical situation, obviously. In the real world, there's going to be correlation between your first preference and your second preference. You're going to have more right-wing and left-wing candidates, and people will tend to clump to one side, which does avoid this. So although the likelihood of this is happening randomly is small, it's less than 10%, the likelihood of this happening unrandomly, which is the system we have, is very small. So it's not really a thing to worry about, but it's kind of a fun quirk. But we know there's not always a Condorcet winner. But there is always something called a Smith set. A Smith set, call it S, has the property that no candidate in S is beaten by one outside of S. So as an example, if we had a B, C, D, and let's say A beats B and C, D can beat A, something like this. Now you might be able to see here, D is a Condorcet winner in this case, but also we have what could be candidates of Smith sets because A and D together also beat everything outside. There is one more condition on the Smith set. It is the smallest set such that this holds. So actually there is a single set that's the Smith set. And if there's a Condorcet winner, the Condorcet winner is the Smith set. Um, now, there is always a Smith set. So in the worst case scenario, it's everyone. But there is always going to be a Smith set. And this is where us voting theorists defer to our friends in graph theory. Because graph theorists look at things like this, and they might call this a tournament. And they would call a set, not necessarily the smallest, just a set that beats everything outside of it, a dominating set. And one key property of dominating sets is that they nest. So in this situation, B, A, and D beat everything outside. But also, within that, D and A beat everything outside. And then D itself also beats everything outside. So these dominating sets, they nest. And what this can tell us is that there's a unique Smith set. So right, we know that Smith sets exist. There might not be a single Condorcet winner. There is a group of them. So now we kind of get onto the key question, the crux of this, of 
what do we do? How do we find this Smith set? We're going to consider an election. And I'm going to write this in a matrix. We're going to have A, B, C, D, E, F. And obviously, they're not going to compete against themselves. And we'll say A beats B. So I'm going to put a 1 here. We'll say A beats C and D, loses to E, and beats F. And we've got to flip it, because B now loses to A, C loses to A, and so on. OK, now I think I'm going to have C beating B. B and D, I'm going to say they draw. So I'll put a half. And then they're going to lose to E and lose to F. Right, C and D. C is going to beat D. C is going to beat E as well, I think, and lose to F. D is going to lose to E, lose to F. E is going to beat F. OK, so this is the result of our election. And now I'm going to add an extra column. And this is something called the Copeland score. So the Copeland score is literally adding up the rows. So A's Copeland score is going to be 4. B's is a half. C is 3. D is a half as well. E is 4. And F is 3. Now, these are genuinely random numbers I've picked, so I don't actually know how this happens. So we're going to see what happens next, um, and it's going to be exciting, and hopefully it's going to demonstrate what I want it to demonstrate. What we're now going to do is rank these based on their coaching score. So I'm going to rewrite this out, but just change the order. So A is top, and then we've got E. So this is now written in order of the coping score. The two that have the highest coping score are automatically going to be in our Smith set. So we're going to put these two in our Smith set. It's always going to be the case. Looking in our Smith set, it's currently A and E. Who beats A and E, right? Well, C. You can see that C beats E. Is A and E beaten them by anyone else? Well, A is only beaten by E, but that's already in our Smith set. So we're going to have to add C to our Smith set. Um, a and E have already been taken care of. OK. Now, who beats C? C is beaten by A already in our Smith set. And F. So we need to add F to our Smith set. OK, now, who beats F? F is beaten by A, already in our set, and E, already in our set. So we're done now. So this is our Smith set for this case. This is called the Copeland method. So we have found our Smith set. This set will beat everything outside the set. So what do we do now? So we know how we can create Smith sets. We know there's always a Smith set and that we can find it. Um, so I guess if you wanted some weird kind of coalition, not that a, E, C, and F are definitely going to uh, agree with each other, but we have, we have options here. In the first case, there's a single method regardless of what happens. The second case employs a different method um, when we have no Condorcet winner. But we're just going to look at the first, the same method for everything. And I'm going to show you, I think, three different, three different methods. And then I will leave you to go and ponder the meaning of the world. <laughs> the first one I want to show you um, is basically what we've already done, right? It's called the Copeland method. And as you may have guessed, it has something to do with the Copeland scores. And you take the winner, whoever has the highest Copeland score. As you can see from the example above, there isn't always a winner, but sometimes there is. And sometimes, even if there's not a Condorcet winner, there might be a winner in this. So that's the Copeland method. Uh, the second one, I think, just has a really cool name, but it's also interesting. It's called the Minimax method. And this has an equation. First, I'm going to introduce one bit of notation. Score, y, x, is the score of y against x. So in an election, that will be the number of votes. Um, but this could easily be applied to a sports match, for example. And what the Minimax does is it takes winner is arg min over x of max over y score y, x. So what this means is, if we get the score that y scores against x, and we take the maximum, so what's the most number of points that are scored against x? And then this finds the minimum. So of all the x's, who concedes the least points in their worst match? Actually, um, this is quite good for the England football team, because the England football team don't score many goals, but they don't let in many goals either. So it's fairly, fairly level. I'm a Scotland supporter who, we don't score many goals, but we do let in an awful lot of goals. <laughs> so we would do badly. Uh, but England, um, the worst score against them is going to be one or two, which is going to rank quite low. So they might get minimax. Now, the final one is called the Dodgson method. And I'm not introducing this because I think it's a good method. What it does is it looks at the fewest pairwise swaps to become Condorcet winner. So part of the reason why I'm not too enamored with this method is 
it still doesn't uniquely always identify a winner. If you were to look right back at our beginning example, you could argue that if you swapped A and C like this, that A becomes a Condorcet winner because we reverse this arrow. But then you could similarly say, oh, well, let's swap B and A here and B becomes it. So there's one swap for each of them. But the cool thing about this is the person who created it. So this was created by Charles Dodson, who everyone watching will have heard of, but not under this name. This is Lewis Carroll of Alice in Wonderland fame, who found his way somehow into political thought and the maths of voting theory. So the moral of the story is, of course this is a bit mad, but I'll let you in on a secret. All the best people are. Accurate representation of everybody's votes. And right now with many voting systems, you can have a certain amount of verifiability. Uh, it's, with the lovely thing about paper ballots is that you can see that you know, what you wrote down is what you intended. And so that, that's a, a very important property and very nice. But once you've cast the paper ballot, you're trusting the uh, chain of custody of those paper ballots to make sure that the count is, is done right and, and that the uh, ballots being counted are the right ones. How do you make sure that that software is what's actually loaded on that voting machine in front of you on the day of the election? And I know that immediately someone is going to want to comment uh, about checksums or crypto, which is great, except now you have to trust the software that's checking that hash, or more likely the one person who is checking it for you. You have just moved the problem. And if you're thinking right now, ah, oh, it's fine, I could verify that, then turn your brain the other way. 